Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Investing Sucks. And I know, I know it's another video about the Silicon Valley bank situation. Everyone's talking about this bank right now, right? Is this the cause of the next financial crisis? Is this something I need to be worried about? And really, I don't like making videos that are kind of on these short-term trendy finance topics. I like to make videos that are more evergreen in nature, right? A video that you can look at three years from now and say, that's still relevant to today. Uh, but also a key focus for me and when I started this YouTube channel is correcting what I would consider common misunderstandings or misconceptions about anything that's going on in the world of finance. And right now with this whole Silicon Valley Bank situation, frankly, I'm seeing a lot of fear mongering and a lot of alarmist content being produced out there, whether it's on the news, it's on Twitter, it's on YouTube. And I really don't think that this is that big a deal. And what I'm hoping to do is provide some a unique perspective on this whole situation and explain what kind of is happening from a more technical standpoint, right? So not just use fancy finance slang that sounds cool, like you know they got caught with their heads underwater and investors are running for the hills now, but actually explain to you what's happening in a way that hopefully you can get some value from, right? So I wanna start with first, what actually went wrong for this bank? And I won't spend too much time on this, but I do want to quickly cover it. And it's pretty easy to actually see if we go to this part of their most recent uh, quarter, uh, their 10K, which was filed uh, only about two weeks ago, and we can quickly understand, you know, where the whole concerns are coming from, right? So let's start with the basics. Now, Silicon Valley Bank, they are a bank, right? So as with any bank, their goal is to take money uh, from depositors, pay them a little bit of interest on that, and then loan out that money at a higher rate of interest and profit the difference, right? So SVB's business model was a little unique in that a lot of the loans they made were in high quality mortgage backed securities, or we could call them loans, you can call them investments, uh, investments in debt securities, you know, same thing at the end of the day. So that's what we're looking at here. These, what they're calling HTM securities, which total 91 billion. A lot of these you see MBS or mortgage backed securities. And this is a type of security that is very susceptible to interest rate hikes, right? Because if you think about a mortgage backed security, what is it, right? It's basically just a pool of mortgages. And if you own a mortgage backed security, your compensation for that investment is the interest paid by those who took out the mortgage. So if interest rates suddenly increase, which we, we know they did, suddenly newer mortgages are yielding more interest. So your old mortgages that you purchased as part of these mortgage backed securities aren't offering as attractive rates to investors, so they lose value because there's more competitive options out there. Investors always want the highest yield they can get. Newer mortgages are yielding more, so sell the older mortgages and move to the more profitable, higher yielding ones that have been originated now. Right, so older mortgage-backed securities, they've lost value. And what's interesting is these losses are somewhat hidden. And what I mean by hidden is that you don't see them on the income statement because of how the accounting works for these particular investments. And to explain this, uh, it's quite easy if we just go to the balance sheet here and we look at this line here, which is uh, HTM held to maturity securities. And what we can quickly find out is that the face value on the balance sheet, $91 billion, and what they're saying the fair value is here is 76 billion. So the fair value is about $15 billion less than what the face value is in the balance sheet. So there's a $15 billion hidden loss that we're seeing here. And if we compare this to what the equity for this business is, their total equity is just over $16 billion. So really, they only have about $1 billion in equity if we account for these hidden losses. And that's why everyone's calling this bank so undercapitalized and why it's ultimately causing a problem. So when it comes to uh, invent, uh, basically the accounting and how the accounting works for these securities, I know it's an accounting lesson. What else would you rather be spending your Sunday doing than getting an accounting lesson from Eric? Uh, but this is an important topic to explain what's happening here. So when it comes to invest uh, accounting for investment securities, there's two ways you can do it. One is AFS or available for sale. The other is HDM or hold to maturity. And under AFS, you have to revalue the securities at their fair value each reporting period. So if they lose value, then you have to record that as an unrealized loss on your income statement and you have to reduce the face value of those securities on your balance sheet, right? Even if you haven't actually sold the securities, you still have to do that and it's called an unrealized loss. Under HTM though, you don't have to do that. So even if they lose value in the near term, you don't actually have to revalue them. And that's what these mortgage-backed securities were designated as. So these losses aren't being recognized even though they do actually exist.
And the reason is because what SVB was going to do with these securities is pull them to maturity, right? That's why they're designated as HTM, pulled to maturity. So if you think about it, with a debt instrument, any value changes along the way doesn't really matter if you hold to maturity, right? Because ultimately, once it does mature, you're going to receive all your principal, you'll receive all your interest along the way, and ultimately the full value of that security, assuming, you know, the person you lent to doesn't go bankrupt. Now, you may be listening to that and thinking, well, that doesn't really sound right. I mean, you're telling me that a company can just make a designation for their investment securities and basically avoid losses by just designated, designating it as HTM. Can't they just artificially inflate their financial statements that way? Uh, well, not really. And the reason for that is uh, SVB, they're a public company, right? And as a public company, they get audited. And this specific area would be very significant for that audit. It would be a huge focus of it because it is so material. It's such a large balance of those investment securities. And a key focus of that audit would be, you know, kind of everything related to the documentation around it. So before they purchase these securities, they have to have a plan in place of what they intend to do with the securities. They can't just buy the securities and then change what they're going to do along the way, classify them as HTM, even if they're going to sell them along the way. If the plan is to not hold them to maturity, they have to be classified as AFS. And you have to stick with your original plan, right? Otherwise, if you don't, auditors are going to flag it and they're probably going to force you to reclassify the securities along the way. So don't think that there's some scheme or some fraud going on here. That's not the case. It is a completely legitimate accounting rule that just in this one very specific instance happened to hide a very huge loss for this one company, right? Now, this in and of itself isn't enough to cause the, the whole SVB failure, right? Because in theory, they could just continue to hold these investments until maturity and then everything's good, right? It becomes a problem when you're actually forced to sell those securities at a loss, which can which can happen if there's a bank run, right? Which is ultimately what happened. Because then, you know, depositors, they want their money out and you invested that money into mortgage-backed securities that lost value. So you can't deliver on the face value of those deposits anymore. And why this happened to cause an issue for SVB was because uh, it was getting more difficult for the companies that they lend to which to show you what I mean by this, again, I'll show you some actual evidence. So we go to this part of their uh, financial report and quite simply they state, our deposits are largely obtained from commercial clients, so not retail clients within the technology, uh, life sciences and healthcare, private equity and venture capital sectors, right? So they're heavily, heavily, heavily focused uh, on Silicon Valley. And what was happening for these businesses in Silicon Valley was, again, because of the higher interest rate environment, it made raising financing more difficult because people are less willing to take risks on speculative businesses like the ones that you know are their customers. When you can get a higher rate of return risk-free, such as you know 5% on GICs or government bonds, you know when you have that option, then suddenly investing in super risky businesses uh, isn't as attractive, especially when you compare that to 2021, when you know you would get basically nothing on government bonds or on GICs. Now that's a lot more attractive, right? People are more willing to take risks. So it was harder for these businesses to raise financing. So ultimately what happened is they had to withdraw their money from their accounts with SVB in order to meet liquidity requirements at their businesses, right? And what I mean by that is things, just simple things, right? Paying vendors, paying your employees, and this just continually built up to the point where fear about the solvency of the bank set in and this bank run happened, right? So that's what went wrong, right? Now I want to talk about why this isn't that big a deal and why all this, you know, alarmist content that you're seeing going around uh, is really just overstating what's actually happening here. And where it's all coming from, all this content, is the implication that this is foreshadowing a broader issue and we're going to see more banks fail, perhaps in the coming weeks, even if more bank runs like this occur because they're not the only bank that is facing this similar problem, right? There's other banks out there that invest in mortgage-backed securities. It's pretty common and they probably have, you know, are in a similar situation. And banks failing is not good for the economy, especially when that bank owes a lot of money to another larger bank that millions of people have entrusted with their money. And now, you know, there's kind of, you know, it, it snowballs and there's other banks that have to recognize losses. And then because of the connections they have with other financial institutions, the classic example of this uh, would be Lehman Brothers in 2008, right? The reason this was, 
you know, some would argue the kickstart to the Great Recession was because Lehman Brothers owed money to a lot of important financial institutions like other banks, insurance companies. So if Lehman Brothers, you know, failed and they can't pay back the other institutions, then it's going to be a larger threat to the broader economy. Now, the only way SVB failing becomes a bigger threat to the economy is if they're exposed to large, you know, very important U.S. banks. So think like J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, those types of banks that, you know, millions and millions and millions of people use. And they're just not. The reality is that's not what's happening here. They are heavily, heavily focused on Silicon Valley specifically, as we can clearly see from this here. And if we take a look at their deposits, are like we said, it's mainly tech companies from Silicon Valley. It's not any major financial institution. And even if it was, those financial institutions have deposit insurance up to $250,000, whereas SVB, as we can see, again, I'll show you some, some actual evidence here. If we look at their uninsured deposits, so that's what this is here uninsured deposits and we can see the estimated uninsured deposits 151 billion and their total deposits is 173 billion right so majority of their deposits again these are commercial deposits they're in excess of this 250 dollars deposit protection limit and you know they're not insured so they're not going to get bailed out and there is a chance that you know they could be on the hook for some losses here so this bank's failure it's isolated to just tech companies right companies that have silicon valley venture capital companies whatever it's not its failure isn't like this lehman brothers moment that's going to cause these ripple effects into the broader economy and why i find this whole thing kind of hypocritical and really you know why it's annoying me to you know see what's happening with again all everything on the news twitter youtube whatever is you know, Silicon Valley's motto has always been move fast and break things right that's what they've embraced that's their motto well, in this case, you know, this bank, they moved fast and they broke. So you have to deal with the consequences. This isn't the taxpayer's job to pay for your awful business models that just can't make money because you spent all your funding on kombucha and ping pong tables, right? And Silicon Valley loves to talk about how regulations are slowing down innovation and the government should stay out of the business, right? And this happens when times are good because, you know, when times are good, you don't have to deal with these concerns. But ultimately, when it's them who's losing the money, suddenly the government needs to step in and bail them out, right? So to this, I say, let them fail, right? Let them deal with the consequences and let this be a lesson to the economy that you have to manage risk properly if you want to be in the banking business, right? Which is an extremely profitable business, but it is highly regulated and it requires you to take the necessary steps. You know, there's a reason why Silicon Valley Bank exists in the first place. There's nothing unique about them as a bank. There's no distinct competitive advantage other than they were just willing to finance businesses that the other banks, the other larger banks, were smart to stay away from, right? This bank is not too big to fail. There's no reason for a bailout. The real risk comes from whether the fear in this sparks potentially more bank runs in the future at other similarly regional banks, right? So kind of similar banks in a situation where they have these losses on HTM securities and they have these hidden losses that we can call them because this might lead to, you know, forced selling of these securities at a loss if there is everyone, you know, the bank run depositors want their money out. Um, and I don't want to say I know for sure what's going to happen because I don't and no one does. It's going to be interesting to see what happens the next week. But I don't see a reason why this bank failing should pose any contagion risk. And Again, going back to the whole you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt that's going on, if that gets to enough people, then that can be what actually happens. It can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I don't think that's what should happen here, right? For all the reasons we talked about. I think this is an isolated issue in one very specific part of the world impacting one very specific contingent of businesses that frankly have been operating in excess for a very long time. And now that the times are no longer good for them, they're trying to spark all this fear and everything. So I know this video was kind of just talking about what's already happened, whereas I usually like to make videos around content, trying to help you understand what's going to happen rather than just, you know, looking in the past, try and look into the future, try and understand trends and whatnot. 
But I hope you did find this video useful and you found it insightful and you learned something from this. And if there was any fear or uncertainty you had in this, hopefully this helped you remain more level-headed and look at the situation you know, from a more logical standpoint. So I hope you did find this video useful. If you did, then please leave a like. And if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you consider subscribing and I'll see you guys in the next video.